Well, good morning. We are continuing our series about being an unshakable people. And so if you'll turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6, that's where we're going to be. Or if you're super cool and you went ahead and downloaded the app, you can actually access the top right hand tile that says Sunday morning. And it's got a spot in there for you to be able to click on your Bible. There's also some sermon notes there. So if you want to follow along on the app and take notes that you can enter into your app right there um, as we as we talk about the message this morning. But in order to be an unshakable people, I think that we as the church need to be able to deal with something called persecution. Nobody wants to be persecuted. It doesn't feel good. It's not an enjoyable experience. But the Bible is very clear that every single person in this room, if you desire to live a godly life, will undergo persecution. There was a lady that I read about this last week. Her name was Toni Richardson. And last year, she uttered these words to her coworker: I will pray for you. These words were overheard by the fellow teachers at the school that she worked at, and it was reported to the board, and the board responded to her with discipline, uh, even threatening to fire her, and so she had to remove her cross necklace. She was, uh, for a year, made sure that she refrained from saying any type of spiritual language, and I just read the update on the article last week that she stood up to them and she fought back. She hired a lawyer, and they ended up backing down from her and her right to have religious freedom and offer prayers for people and be the religious person, the Christian, that she is. And what an incredible example of somebody who comes under religious persecution, takes a stand, and God blesses her for it. Well, Daniel was in a much worse situation. It's not that easy. Daniel is in a nation that it really doesn't matter uh, whether or not he wants religious liberty. He's going to function according to the king. And if you remember from last week, King Belshazzar had died, and it was that very night. Now, I want you to put yourself in Daniel's position. You're a very powerful, influential individual of the kingdom of Babylon. The king, Belshazzar, has just been killed, and it was very typical. In fact, it was law by the Medo-Persian Empire that if you were a lawbreaker or a perpetrator, they not only killed you, but they killed everyone in your family on that very same day. They didn't wait for you to be in jail for many, many years. They would execute you, and as we'll see in this story of Daniel, they would execute your wife and your children and all relatives close to you because they didn't want a rebellion to take place. And so you've got a change in government, and here's Daniel, the third most powerful person in the kingdom, and whose head do you think is probably going to be on the chopping block? Well, of course, it's Daniel, right? I mean, what better way to make sure you don't have a rebellion than to eliminate everybody that's high up in the government? And so here's Daniel, and he uh, has this new kingdom. The Medo-Persian Empire comes in in Daniel chapter 6, and Daniel is probably scared out of his mind. But Daniel has this in, in his mind as well. God is faithful. God is true. I trust you, Lord. God, you are faithful, you are true, and I trust you. And so if this is the end of my life, just like Belshazzar's, I accept it. You see, Daniel knew, according to Jeremiah chapter 25, look at this scripture with me up on the screen. He knew the prophecy of persecution of Babylon. Babylon would eventually fall. Jeremiah said this, This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the kingdom of Babylon for 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans. I will make it an everlasting desolation. And so in 609 BC, Nebuchadnezzar had defeated Assyria and took over the surrounding kingdoms, including Israel. And here Daniel stands, 539 BC, and he tells Belshazzar, Belshazzar, you're going to die this very night. The 70 years were up. And Daniel knew the Persian kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom, was actually going to take over. And this is so fascinating. The prophet Isaiah, a hundred years, a hundred to hundred and fifty years before Persia took over Babylon, Isaiah looked forward into the future by the inspiration of God, and he said the Medes are actually going to take over Babylon. Look at this scripture, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 7. God said, Behold, I am going to stir up the Medes against them, Babylon, who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. I mean, you want to talk about the inspiration of Scripture. 150 years before Babylon is ever even destroyed, you got somebody looking forward to the future and said, The Medes are going to destroy them. Look at verse 19 of of Isaiah 13. Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride will be overthrown by who? By God. 
just like Sodom and Gomorrah. One day, God is going to overthrow them. And this is exactly what we find in Daniel chapter 5 and in Daniel chapter 6. One day, Babylon was overthrown. By who? Ultimately, by God. You see, this is what the Lord prophesied. He said in Isaiah 45, verse 1, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the loins of kings, and to open doors before him, so that gates will not be shut. Guess who was the king of the Medo-Persian empire that overthrew Babylon? It was a man named Cyrus. And you can look this up in history. A historian named Herodotus wrote a lot about it. It's found in cuneiform clay tablets uh, of the history of the Persian Empire. And this is incredible. 150 years, God prophesies, I'm going to send a man named Cyrus who's going to take over the entire world. And he's specifically going to take over Babylon. And it was swift. It happened in one night. In fact, Herodotus the historian says that Cyrus diverted the Euphrates River, which ran right through the kingdom of Babylon, and his army marched in without even fighting. No blood was, it was spilled at all. And this is incredible, because here Daniel finds himself fulfilling prophecy written in Scripture 150 years ago. But Daniel was also undergoing persecution. And so this morning, we're going to look at the providence of persecution and what Daniel went through. And hopefully, you'll be able to take some of these same principles applied to Daniel, and you'll apply them to yourself. You see, the simple truth is, is that if Babylon had not arisen to power, the nation of Judah would have never come under their control. If the nation of Judah would have never come under their control, uh, Daniel would have never been transferred to Babylon as a captive and faced persecution. We read about this the last five weeks. If Daniel would have never been persecuted, he never would have arisen to power and control and majesty and might and had the opportunity to influence the king. If Daniel would have never had the opportunity to influence the king because he's been persecuted, he would have never been in the position to be appointed as the next regent and reign, uh, reigning empire, so to speak, over Babylon. And that's exactly what we find in Daniel chapter 6 verse 1. You see, God is at work in Daniel's persecution, and God is going to be at work in your persecution as well. Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible says it pleased, and you heard Darius, a lot of us refer to the name as Darius. (coughs) The correct correct pronunciation is actually Darius, okay? So I hope I don't throw you off this morning when I use the word Darius. But it says here that it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. These were government protectors, so to speak. And with three administrators over them, one whom was who? Daniel. And so here's Daniel, has lived such a godly life, has such a great reputation, that he's not only appointed as the kingdom ruler over Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, But now, under Darius the Mede, the Persian kingdom, he gets the same position again. This is incredible. And it says that these satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. You see, they had a checks and balances system. When you appoint one person that has complete power, what typically happens? The power goes to their head, they become a monarch. And so what the Persians did is they appointed three people over one region. And it says in verse 3 that now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom, the whole kingdom of Babylon. And so throughout all of this persecution, throughout all of this hurt and pain, remember, Daniel had been threatened with assassination. Daniel had been threatened probably with fire. Daniel had been threatened with captivity. He was taken captive. Daniel has not lived a picture-perfect life here, folks. But yet this man is a godly man who loves the Lord, who continues to rise to the top. And so Daniel knows that once again, even though he's, he's appointed to a position of power, persecution is promised. It's not going to be easy. And I think a lot of us can identify with that, right? I mean, life is not easy. Uh, We get sick, people die, we lose our jobs, our kids leave the faith, our parents leave the faith. I mean, life certainly is not easy. It has not been easy for me, and I can guarantee that it also has not been easy for you. And so Daniel, even though he's undergoing this persecution and he knows life isn't going to be easy, he is right where God wants him to be. He's wise, he's experienced, he's knowledgeable. The man at this point is over 80 years old, going almost 90 years old. You would be lucky to live past 50 in ancient biblical times. 
People would die just from infections in their teeth because they didn't have dentists, okay? I mean, Daniel was somebody that is tried and true. And the guy is an incredible administrator. He possesses qualities and spiritual gifts that God has given him. And so Daniel knows. Daniel knows, God, you are ultimately in control. If I live or if I die, you are in control. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. Look at verse 4. It says, Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to the government affairs. And look what kind of man he is. But they could find no ground of accusation or of evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. The guy is flawless, so to speak. But he can't even catch a break at rocking almost 90 years old, right? I mean, come on, man. You've lived a long life. You're in retirement age. And yeah, here you are serving the king again. But give the guy a break for crying out loud. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's, I don't know how much longer this guy has left. But God is not finished with Daniel. And this is such an incredible truth to all of you who are maybe in that same age range. God is not done with you yet. Just because you have reached a mature age, and I think that we ought to refer to ages, I said this a few weeks ago, we ought to refer to ages as levels. You know what I'm saying? Rather than age, levels sell so much better. It's like, hey, what level are you at? I'm at a level 80. You know what I mean? And so Daniel has reached like the top level. You know what I'm saying? Like Daniel was experienced. And so once again, these people are trying to conspire against him, and they can't find anything, but they found one thing, what they thought to be a weak point. Look at verse 5. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against the laws of his God. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps and the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into a lion's den. You see, they changed the, the tactic of persecution. The uh, Persians had a god of fire that they worshipped. And so instead of having the, the, the fiery furnace like we found in Daniel chapter 3, lions reigned everywhere at this time. And so they gathered hundreds of lions and they built this huge dome. And instead of being a dome like this, it was an upside dome like this into the ground. And they would actually lower an individual down in or even throw them in. And then the lions would be starved for weeks and they would devour them within minutes. They also, historians do believe, some, that they had an access door here at the bottom to where they could go in and get the lions out or do whatever they needed to do within that lion's den. And so they go to the king and they say, king, you should make this injunction. For 30 days, no one is allowed to pray or call upon any god or any man unless it's first by your name. They're scheming. They've got a trick. They've got a plot. And look at this King Darius. Poor guy, you can tell. He gets tricked pretty easily here. And see what happens. It says in verse 9, or excuse me, verse 8, Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed. This was Persian law. Once a document was signed by the king, not even the king could overturn it. And if you read the book of Esther, you'll find this emphatically true with the king of Persia. And it says, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. And so these manipulators, these schemers, they cared nothing for the truth. They cared nothing for the state or the king or the religion. It wasn't about being transparent or being honest. It was about power and control. Kind of sounds a lot like our politicians today, right? I mean, I really don't trust too many politicians. They usually don't apologize until they get caught. Most of them are found to be hypocrites. And it's just really sad. I mean, absolutely complete distrust in the government. And so this is where Daniel finds himself. And King Darius is being influenced. They recognize that Daniel would not obey man but God. And so they seek to put a trap. And the context is very, very clear. Daniel came into a full-fledged confrontation between his faith and state law. You see, to invoke the name of Darius would be idol worship. And Daniel couldn't do that because that would break the law of God. And so what is Daniel going to do? Well, isn't it interesting that as we find in the book of Daniel, what is under attack? Prayer. They knew that Daniel was a praying man. And they knew that Daniel received his power, his ability from God. 
And so what better way to sever a person from God than to cut off the power of prayer? I don't know if you were aware of this. Many of you were. It made national news. Uh, the psychopath atheist who went into a Baptist church down in Texas and opened fire on dozens of people and murdered them. And so naturally, people go online, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and one of the first things they offer up as a Christian is what? It's prayer. And what do you find people who do not understand God and who do not know the ways of the Lord, they attack prayer. Look at a couple of these tweets that people tweeted out. When people offered up prayer, one man said, well, they were in a church praying when this happened. What they need is gun control, not prayer. Another man responded, the murdered victims were in a church. If prayers did anything, they'd still be alive. A complete misunderstanding of the providence of prayer, of the power of prayer. And it is something that is attacked. Stop sitting back doing nothing and praying. Get up off your butt and do something about it. A complete attack on prayer. Prayer has been removed from our public schools, hasn't it? I share the story of you with Tony Richardson at the beginning of this message. That here she was just telling a co-worker that she would pray for someone that was overheard in a private conversation and the power of prayer is attacked. I'd like to encourage you this morning that you too can be right where God wants you to be. And even though you might feel attacked with prayer, you might feel persecuted for your religious beliefs in Jesus, this is promise. You are guaranteed that if you want to live a godly life, you will undergo persecution. It's guaranteed. Look what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. He said, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so if you've been a Christian up to this point, and you have faced zero persecution, you may want to reevaluate whether or not you're living a godly life in Jesus. You see, how does Daniel respond? What is Daniel's response here? Well, I can think of a few ways that Daniel was also attacked and under persecution. I can think of several ways with you. How about the fact that our Christian doctrine is under persecution at our universities with scientism and naturalism and atheism? How about the fact that we're under persecution with our Christian ideology and philosophy of materialism? Just, just look after yourself. Buy everything for yourself. Store up for yourself, right? Conformism, do the things that we do the way that we do them. It doesn't matter if you have religious convictions or religious beliefs, Daniel. You need to conform to the way that we do things. And we find this in our country, in our communities, in our universities today. How about politics? This is what Daniel went through. Slander, false accusations. Christians can become misrepresented by false Christianity and people who don't really practice Christianity. How about in the workplace? Here was Daniel working for the king, and maybe there were people like his superiors or at least his co-workers who were so anti-God, anti-Yahweh, that they set up laws and precepts in order to prevent him from being able to practice what he knew to be true. The same can be true for you and I. And surprisingly, and this is what's crazy, you can even be persecuted right here in the church. There can be people in this room who walk around with a spirit and a mindset of condemnation and judgmentalism. All right, not being judging, I mean, that's what the Bible teaches, but judgmentalism and hypocrisy. And you can even be persecuted right here in these very walls among this group of people. It can happen. Persecution can be all around us. So how should we deal with persecution? What would God tell Daniel to do? Well, check this scripture out in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Peter writes this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which among you which comes for you, for what? For your testing. Your faith is being tested. As though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. God is faithful. God is true. I trust you, Lord. Keep on rejoicing. Be prepared for persecution. Don't be surprised when you're persecuted at work, in school, amongst your families, maybe even in this very church or in this United States of America. Don't be surprised as if some strange thing is happening to you. This is the life. This is what you signed up for. This is what you agreed to, Daniel. This is what you agreed to, Christian. And so we should keep on rejoicing. And here's what a lot of people mistake, right? When the Bible says we should have joy and rejoice, a lot of people think that you should have the emotion of joy. 
In other words, you should feel joyful even when you go through bad stuff. Well, that's simply not true. You're allowed to be broken and to cry and be distressed. Joy is an attitude. I am going to praise the Lord. I am going to give thanks to him even when I don't feel like it. God wants us to have an attitude of joy, and this can be one of the most challenging things in Scripture. And I cannot think of a better example than Daniel. Look at how Daniel responds in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been uh, finished or signed, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees, giving thanks to God. Keep on rejoicing, just as he had done before. And so you see the attitude of joy is manifest in the action of thankfulness. In other words, thankfulness is an expression of joy. Do you give God thanks when you don't feel good? Do you give God thanks when things don't go your way? Do you give God thanks when you're diagnosed with a disease or you lose your job or something bad happens to you? Do you give God thanks when you're undergoing persecution? You see, having this mindset of joy, keep on rejoicing, expressing an attitude of joy is the antidote to persecution. Our joy comes from the hope in God's promises. And just like Daniel, even though we are persecuted, even though we face hardship and trial, the Bible says, don't give up on giving thanks to God. And look what Daniel prayed. God, I thank you. What did he have to be thankful for? I mean, the guy was on the verge of losing everything, his very own life, and not a very enjoyable way. I mean, I don't know about you, but I really don't want to go out having my limbs ripped from my body and being eaten. Right? I mean, this is what Daniel was faced with. And yet he's giving thanks to God. Psalms chapter 55 verse 17 says this. Evening and morning and noon I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. This is a a prayer of petition. To have a petition means to throw yourself up on the grace of God. Asking for his mercy. Daniel's the kind of guy who prays for his food at work and at school even when others don't. He's the kind of guy that talks about Jesus when others are afraid to. He would read his Bible when others would mock him and ridicule him. He would invite people to church, even knowing that he'd probably get rejected. He isn't afraid to do everything possible to live in such a way that would bring God honor and glory. There is nothing he isn't willing to sacrifice. There is nothing he isn't willing to do to make sure that God gets the glory in his life. And so the key word would simply be this. Daniel is unashamed. He's unashamed. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, For I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. I'm not afraid to express my faith. There is nothing that man can do to me. I don't care what type of laws and government regulations and ideas and philosophies that you put to me. I am unashamed to follow after Jesus. And they knew this about Daniel. They knew that they thought the weak point in Daniel's life was the fact that he was fierce in his faith. The fact that he would not bow to this God called Darius who built himself up to be something that he wasn't. The story goes on in Daniel 6.11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel, Daniel making petition and supplication of his God. They knew what they would find and they did it amongst themselves. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Dear king, remember this law that you signed into effect? Look what they say. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any other god or man besides you would be thrown into the lion's den? And the king replied, this statement is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel who was one of those low-life exiles from Judah, right? I mean, slander, derogatory comments, who pays no attention to you. He has betrayed you, king. He is against you. He is a a loyal servant of Babylon. You ought to to kill him just like you did uh, Belshazzar, is what they're saying. O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but he keeps making his petitions three times a day. He's not just praying once. He's doing it over and over again to rub it in your face, in other words. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed, and he set his mind on delivering Daniel. 
And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. The king knew he made a mistake. Then these men came by agreement to the king. They're like, he's not doing anything. Let's go remind him of the Persian law that he lives and walks by. Recognize, O king, that this is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no injunction or statue which the king establishes may be changed. And so they're slandering Daniel. To slander means to change what is right for what is wrong. It means to substitute what is good for what is bad. When you blaspheme someone or you slander someone, it means to call a good thing bad. We can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. When God comes into our life and he works on our life and we say, no, that's not of God, I reject it, I don't accept it, I'm leaving it, that's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the only unforgivable sins found in Scripture. And so here are these people slandering and blaspheming Daniel. They're also scheming evil, wicked plots against him because they want this man dead, because they're jealous and they're filled with envy. Proverbs 14.22 says, Do not those who plot evil go astray, but those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. And here's Daniel probably thinking, hold on a second, God. I have honored the king. I have lived by your statues, and I trust you. You are faithful. You are true. I trust you, Lord. I believe that whether life or death comes by me, you will you will." Do good by me, Lord. You will bring love and goodness to me. I honor you and I trust you. You see, Daniel is already receiving love and kindness from the king. Look at verse 14. It says that the king had felt sick to his stomach, in other words, and had already started thinking, how can I save Daniel? I trust Daniel. I know what kind of man Daniel is. How can I get out of this injunction, this law? And he thought about it all day. Remember, the law of the Persians and the Medes. They'd kill you that very day if you were a lawbreaker because they didn't want rebellion. And so if you can imagine it like this, they come probably in the morning or the middle of the day. They remind the king of the law and injunction they set in place. And then uh, King Darius spends the rest of the day trying to figure out how to get rid of it. And just before he goes to bed, they come knocking on his door. O king, O king, remember what you said. Remember the law, lest you be found guilty. And so our story continues. We see this providence of persecution. Here is King Darius making a vow, making a promise far too quickly. It says in Daniel chapter 6 verse 16, So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. Then the king said said to Daniel, Daniel, your God whom you serve continually rescue you. This isn't a slander, right? The king is on Daniel's side. He is invoking the name of God above himself. Daniel, may God help you. May God save you. And a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. They would probably attach this string around it with a wax portion, and the king would come up and impress his seal upon that as an official regulation. This is done, and it's over with. And look what happened to the king. It says in verse 18, the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. What have I done? You ever made a promise and you regret it? You're like, what have I done? I've made a big mistake. I should not have promised that. (laughs) I should not have bought that car. I should not have done this. You know what I mean? Like, I immediately regret this decision. (laughs) That's that's what the king is like. But Daniel was a really good man. And Daniel cost this, uh, or Darius cost this guy his life. I mean, his life is on the line. It's like passing a law as a politician, realizing that all these children are aborted and they're dying. Can you imagine the guilt that would be upon a man that would pass that type of law where people would die? Uh, But yet, our politicians are able to do it conscious-free. That tells you a little bit about their character. At least Darius had reached a point in his life where he knew to kill an innocent person was absolutely wrong, and he felt guilty about it. You see, the key phrase is simply this. Here is Daniel, fulfilling God's purpose, and whether by deliverance or death, that's not what matters. God's purpose is what matters. And so it wasn't about what was comfortable to him. It was about what is God's purpose, and how can I fulfill it? And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul had in mind. If you've studied the life of Paul at all, he was beaten, he was stripped naked, he was stoned and actually died and came back to life. And you can read about that in the book of Acts. I mean, the guy lived a horrible, persecuted life. 
He was ran out of cities. He was yelled at and condemned. Uh, He was imprisoned for many, many years. He was uh, sentenced to death to fight in a ring in Ephesus. And he had to fight wild beasts. And he actually won and lived. And so he had all of this life happen to him. And look what the Apostle Paul said about the providence of persecution. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 12, the Apostle Paul wrote this to his Christian brothers and sisters. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served for the advance of the gospel. God is working in his providence. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in change for Jesus. I'm in this situation for Jesus, for God. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. This is the exact opposite of what the Jews and the Gentile Romans wanted to happen. They thought that if they would persecute Paul, they could shut him up and it actually emboldened other people to stand up for the truth, to stand up for Jesus. You know, it's amazing what can happen by one school teacher who takes a stand and says, I stand up for what is right and for what is true. The same thing could be for you. What kind of encouragement can you be to your family, your peers, your co-workers, your community by standing up for the truth of God in the face of persecution? He goes on to say in verse 19, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision, God's providence of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. In other words, my sanctification, my hope. God, I trust you. You're in control. And even though you're letting me go through this persecution, I know that you are at work in my pain. I know that your providence is in control and you will win. And so just like the Apostle Paul, God's providence is at work in Daniel. Look at verse 19. Then the king arose at dawn and at the break of the day, he went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said, Daniel! Servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the den of lions? And Daniel spoke. Can you imagine how good that would feel to the king? You know what I mean? Daniel spoke and said, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not even harmed me. Inasmuch as I was found innocent before him and also towards you, king, I have committed no crime. In other words, even though they accuse me of betraying you, I have not betrayed you. I have honored my duty. I have served you faithfully. And I have also honored God. Verse 23. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury was found on him because he had trusted in his God. God, I trust you. You are faithful. You are true. I trust what you're doing in my life. I trust what you're doing in this situation. Does anybody feel bad for the lions? Like, I read this story, and I'm like, oh, man, the lions. I mean, they're starving, you know what I mean? And there's a bunch of them, and they're not eating each other because lions don't really do that. And so here comes the angel of the Lord, and they got this delicious treat sitting right before them, and he shuts all of their mouths. One person said the reason why they didn't eat Daniel is because he was nothing but backbone. Yes! You laughed. You got it. I told that joke to Angel, and she's like, what? I don't get it. That doesn't make sense. I'm like, I'm telling the joke anyways. It's cool. (laughs) And so the moral of the story is simply this. Because he had trusted in his God, God delivered him. Daniel was faithful, and Daniel was willing to die. And that can be very true for some of us. It could be in the providence of God that your life is what will cost God's plans and his purposes. And a lot of people in this room have heard about people who have been persecuted and who have been killed and who have died for the glory of God. And so look what happens. Remember that proverb we read about the one who plots wicked schemes will fall, will set a trap for himself. But the one who plots what is good and does good, goodness and love will be upon him. Look what happens in the conclusion of the story. Then the king gave the orders, and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel, and they cast them, Persian law, and their families, their wives, and their children into the lion's den. And they had not even reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed their bones. That's how hungry these lions were. That's why I felt bad for the lions, right? 
But this, this really isn't a joke. This really isn't a laughing matter. We're talking about women and children. And that's how ruthless and cruel the Medo-Persian Empire was. They would kill you and your family. And so here they receive the execution. By the way, this was forbidden in Deuteronomy 24. Uh, the Israelites kings were not allowed to punish families of the perpetrator. And so God's law did progress through history and God forbade the Israelites from punishing other people other than the one who committed the crime, which is the right thing to do. And then look at the victory in verse 25. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples and nations and men of every language who were living in the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and to tremble before God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And his kingdom will be forever. And he delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lion's den. And so here, Daniel's faithfulness, his trust in the Lord, his persecution have worked out for the providence of God. And it set the stage for Daniel once again to rise to the top. Look at verse 28. So Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Darius was a governor appointed over Babylon, the king over Babylon, but the true king was Cyrus the Persian. And this is what's so incredibly true, and I do not want you to miss this this morning. The providence of Daniel's persecution. I told you at the beginning of this message that Isaiah prophesied 150 years before the Medo-Persian Empire that there would be a man named Cyrus who would be the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's anointed. He would destroy Babylon and he would set the stage for the Jews to return back to their holy land. Look at Isaiah 44, 28 up on the screen. God said of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and I will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. When Cyrus invaded Babylon, he diverted the Euphrates River. He marched his army right into uh, Babylon. There was a man in Babylon by the providence of God who knew the Israelite scriptures, who was powerful enough and prominent enough to influence the king, who held honor and prestige, and by the word of him, showing, look at what Isaiah said about you, would be the domino effect that would cause King Cyrus of Persia to send the Jews back to the Holy Land to fulfill the providence of God, that one day the Messiah would be born. Who was that man? It was Daniel. God saw a man in Israel who would be taken captive to Babylon, who would undergo such terrible persecution for the greater good, that he would ascend to a position of power, that in God's foreknowledge of King Cyrus of Persia entered the city, there would be a man named Daniel who could influence Cyrus in such a way to fulfill the providential plan of God. God is at work. Look what King Cyrus said in Ezra 1. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. And any of his people among you may go to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And may their God be with them. I find that fascinating. I find that incredible. You see, God is at work even when we don't realize it. And so what's the point? Right? What's the point of this whole story of Daniel? But it's simply this. God is at work in order to maximize his relationship with his created beings. God's providence is working in your life that you may share the gospel with people in your work, in your family, in your communities to influence them in such a way that they would come into a relationship with Jesus. This is what Paul said in Acts 17. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of this earth having determined their times and their boundaries and their habitation, that they would do what? That they would seek God. If perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. God is at work in your life. God has put you in a position and a place that you would come into a relationship with him. And maybe you've been a Christian for many years and you've gone through such terrible things. This morning, I want you to reflect on what God has done in your life and how he's used that for his glory and how he can use that for his glory. And if you're not a Christian and you're here this morning, God has been working in your life to get you to this point that you would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and enter into a relationship with him. That's the whole reason 
why God set up Daniel in those times, in those places, that the Messiah would be born and die on a cross so that you could be saved. You want to talk about the providence of God. It is so very powerful. And so I want to encourage you this morning that we're going to sing this song of invitation. And if you are not in a relationship with Jesus, open up your eyes and realize that God is at work for you. And when we, we invite you this morning to obey the gospel, place your faith and your trust in the name of Jesus, be baptized for the remission of your sins, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and live your life for him, working and loving and striving in a relationship with him. Would you stand and pray with me? Lord, this morning we give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you glory, God, for loving us, for showing us your grace, for working in your providence. We, God, we know that you're in ultimate control. God, thank you for giving us the freedom to choose to walk towards you or walk away from you. And God, this morning we walk towards you. Thank you for a man named Daniel who gave us the example of life, of liberty, of truth, and that he truly was set free because he was fiercely following and in faith with you. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your truthfulness. Thank you for your grace. We trust you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.